All right, we will get started here. Um, good morning, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is James Okulo. I am Director of System Planning at ESIG. Uh, and what, what a great morning it is in a great location. So thank you to, to Charlie and Ryan and the rest of the team for finding this spectacular venue that we're using. And, and what a great morning to speak about HVDC, right? Um, I think more and more, there is a realization that significantly more transmission is going to be needed for the energy transition. Uh, there's a number of studies that are talking about 2x the times, um, the amount of transmission that we need to build. Uh, some go as far as 5x that we will need to be able to meet the goals that we're all planning towards, right? And, and one of the key technologies that is bound to be a major player is HVDC. Uh, and I think by the, the attendance in this room, uh, there is large agreement that that is, is going to be a force for good. Uh, however, we, we realize that there isn't much training and much education and much knowledge on HVDC. There's a lot of misconceptions. There's questions about its maturity. There's questions about the technology itself um, and its functionality and its capabilities. And that's, that's why we're here. Uh, and so we have a stellar, stellar group of uh, presenters that's going to be talking uh, to us this morning, uh, going in depth on HVDC. Uh, we'll be starting with, with Hannes and Chandra, who will be giving us a, an overview, uh, which is based on, on an incredible report that they just put out um, that, that I think is must reading for, for all of us. Uh, and then we'll go to, to Eugen, who will be covering the technical details uh, of HVDC, and then we'll round it off with uh, Henry and Jin that are looking at specific projects uh, and how they have studied those, how they have actually done the evaluation. And so I'm hoping that through this series of, of conversations, we really get not only a, a nice rounded overview, uh, but we jump into some of the specific details uh, on the technology. And, and I'm hoping that there'll be lots of questions through, throughout this. This is a tutorial. Uh, we've made each of the sessions fairly long, right? And so uh, the hope is that we'll be able to go in depth uh, in each one of these, each one of these topics. Um, and so we are not doing uh, in-depth introductions now because we have a lot of material that we want to jump into. Uh, so I'll invite uh, Hannes uh, and Chandra to to the podium. Uh, Hannes is a principal with the Brattle Group, has over twenty five years in the industry, and is really a, a well known a well known entity in this in this space. Uh, and we're really glad to have him. Uh, Chandra has fifteen years of experience uh, with uh, DNV, uh, ABB, GE, uh, and has been an author and a couple of patents as well in HVDC. So you're in, you're in extremely good hands uh, as we get kicked off here with this uh, overview session. So Arnes, Chandra, welcome. Thank you, James. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's uh, beautiful if you've been down to the beach. Uh, if you haven't been down to the beach yet, you should definitely do it tomorrow morning. Uh, it's quite stunning. Um, I don't think I've been at an ESIC uh, meeting since before pandemic. So as, as we say in Austria, I'm back. Um, but more importantly, uh, you know, this is a, about uh, the report that we've written um, a month ago or so published a month ago, a little bit more than that. And uh, our colleague, uh, Cornelius Plett, uh, couldn't be here with us because he is, uh, his wife is expecting to uh, have a baby in a week or so. Uh, but he he sent me a T-shirt and he made me promise to to wear it. So I have to show you the T-shirt that 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 he sent us. I know it's it's a little bit of a risky move, but but I think it's worth it. <laughs> Established 1889. So HVDC has been with us for a long time. Uh, and that T-shirt, uh, if you call KS, he might have some others that he, is, that he can share. Um, but what we're gonna talk about in the next uh, few minutes is what our, why we did the study, uh, what HVDC technology is. Uh, we're not gonna get into the technical detail that uh, our friends from uh, Siemens will, will do. Um, and then we talk about some case studies. There's a lot of experience out there that is not neatly summarized, that is difficult to find, a lot of misconceptions, and we'll get into some of that. 
uh, about HVDC planning. It's sort of a different animal, animal than AC planning, and there are a lot of challenges that the technology is facing uh, beyond uh, the misconceptions. So to give you an overview, HVDC technology has evolved dramatically over the last five to 10 years, and it's hard to keep track just how much technology is new, is operational, is functional, and uh, has a lot of experience uh, under its belt. Uh, it offers higher capacity, longer distance, lower loss transmission on a smaller footprint than AC. Uh, in particular, the development of voltage source converters has offered dramatic improvement in capabilities, including uh, great services that are extremely valuable to have on the existing AC grid. Uh, we have about 50 gigawatts of VSC-based HVDC transmission projects in operation today, um, about 130 gigawatts planned, but only about 3% of the operating VSC-based systems are in North America. So North America is quite behind in the utilization of that technology. Uh, and because system operators are less familiar with HVDC, it's hard for them to fully um, assess the benefits that this technology can, can provide. But there are significant planning challenges, supply chain challenges, operational challenges, and regulatory challenges that have to be addressed. So uh, that is really important. That's why we have put together this report. It's 200 pages with like 300 cross references to other work. Uh, it is really uh, a source that if you need to get up to speed on the very details of that, including uh, from a sort of regulatory planning markets side, uh, I encourage you to have a look at that report. Let me um, have Chandra go through the next few slides. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Yeah, just to start with the basic, what, what, what HVDC means basically. Yeah, as you, as you see on the slide screens, uh, HVDC is basically high voltage direct current technology. And uh, it's traditionally been used to transmit the power over long distance. You know, this is the main purpose, like when once the technology, you know, like initial days when it was invented, the purpose was to optimize the losses, basically, when you transmit over a long distance. As you uh, see on the screens, yeah, in HVDC, you do have... Uh, like three major components in a HVDC system. Like the three components are like, uh, the first one is being like rectifier, where you convert AC into DC, and then you put the DC power onto the DC lines. And then you send this uh, uh, power over a long line, and then when it reaches the destination, then you convert back DC into AC, and then you dump into the AC grid. The main purpose is that like, you know, the DC, it is a zero frequency and because of the zero frequency you do get a lot of advantages the firstly yeah when there is no frequency you don't have a magnetic field when there is no magnetic field there is no flux linkage when there is no flux linkage there is no reactance when there is no reactance there is no reactive power when there is no reactive power yes yeah the line you can use utilize very efficiently that means basically we can make conductor very uh, i mean thinner compared to the ac system and you can optimize it at the same time, in three in AC, you are sending power over three conductors. In the DC, you are sending the power over two conductors. That means basically your uh, right of way for a transmission line corridor is small, you know. And further, as I said, like because of the zero frequency, you, you also don't have a skin effect. When you don't have a skin effect, again, you can use the conductor optimally, and also, yeah, uh, losses are reduced. And at the same time, these converters, uh, as I said, like main key components in the HVDC, they're converting AC to DC, and same time, they can precisely control power flow in the DC circuit, basically. That makes HVDC so attractive, actually. Yeah. I think here we try to show like the used cases where we seen HVDC in uh, various applications. Because of this flexibility, the HVDC is being deployed in several applications. To start with, as I said, the technology initial for initial uh, during initial days, it was like meant to transmit power over long distances. 
and that was a main reason, a main uh, application. And then, as I said, like because of no frequency, uh, because of no reactive power, because of several things, you can, uh, yeah, your transmission corridor is like optimal compared to AC. That is one application traditionally we see. And then, as I said, like DC, uh, these converters are like power electronic based. Therefore, you can precisely control. That means like in a grid where you need really, uh, uh, when you need to have a real, really uh, full controllability, then these, yeah, these HVDC converters will be really useful. And then the main one more uh, thing which you can't do with uh, AC connections is asynchronous con connections where you have two uh, asynchronous networks, but still you wanted to transfer power between these uh, networks then you can use a HVDC. These are the main pillars, main applications which we see in the industry. And going into the each box, yeah, as I said, like asynchronous, you can connect to different asynchronous grids. Like you can build a back-to-back -back converter. Yeah, you the back-to-back -back converters means basically the rectifier and inverter, both are sitting in same building basically. And uh, we are using these back-to-back -back converters to you know pump uh, power from one side to other side. And same time, you're not connecting the two grids. AC point of view, they are in completely isolated, but still we are doing power flow management between these two asynchronous grids. That is one of the application. And uh, one more is uh, uh, with respect to right of ways, uh, the example, I mean, the, the main uh, application where we can think of HVDC is for city uh, power and feed. Yeah, especially when you wanted to, you know, import a lot of power to the uh, city, urban areas, especially, you know, when you want to send the power over transmission lines, a lot of right of ways, and you, in, in cities, you don't have a place, basically, you know, then HVDC, is, uh, HVDC along with a cable is a perfect uh, solution. You bring a lot of power through the cables, and then using the converter, you put it back into the grid. And the same time, HVDC doesn't like you're dumping a lot of power, same time HVDC doesn't contribute to short circuit, increasing short circuit currents. That means, yeah, no need to replace your existing infrastructure. But the same time you're dumping a lot of power that uh, benefit brings. And similarly, you also see like uh, applications which uh, fitting in uh, long distance and also same time optimizing right of ways is like when you wanted to transmit power, you know, uh, uh, through uh, C or something, water cross crossing. Especially uh, DC is good because you know you don't you need a lot of right of way, and also you can send the power over long distances. Tr uh, traditional, I mean, typically with the AC transmission, you can't go more than few kilometers, like um, uh, sixty to hundred kilometers. Yeah, more than that, it is. If you want to go, it's like not efficient, not economical, basically. And similarly, undergrounding, underground cables. Yeah, HVDC is perfect combination with underground cables. And the, uh, the last one, as you see on the top of the uh, uh, figure, uh, is uh, to reinforce uh, transmission flow within the, within a balancing area. Basically, you have a tool. You can precisely control the power in the transmission line so that you can efficiently manage power flows in the transmission network. That means basically uh, you can use it, this function to optimally adjust the power flows, optimize the losses, and you can uh, we can get advantages. And also, I mean, next application is uh, we can also uh, control uh, the power flows between between two different uh, different balance balancing areas. And as I said, like before, yeah, this this is a tool to also you know uh, do power flow reinforcement. I mean, uh, transmission re reinforcement between two asynchronous grids. And nowadays, we are also seeing applications like oil and gas platform supply. Like the trend is like, uh, uh, like if you have like remote areas, you have oil and oil and ga gas platforms, where like if you are utilizing like diesel generators to you know produce power and uh, power up the machinery on the platform gas, it's not efficient. Same time, it's also a lot of uh, you know uh, carbon dioxide production. Nowadays, people thinking like, how can we bring the power from the shore into the platform? Now we see we seen like uh, recently there were a couple of projects in the Middle East. The big projects, the uh, is, uh, power is uh, like the project is purpose is to get the power from shore into the uh, oil and gas platform, basically. And also one more application is island supply. HVDC is feeding completely. It's like small island where you don't have a grid, bigger grid. 
but at the same time you are bringing the power and you are uh, you are uh, come uh, you are you are feeding to the lords in the island basically and this is another days like yeah like you see, you hear a lot about this renewable offshore interconnection yeah like many projects are coming up in this uh, in uh, in this uh, area basically this is hvdc is used to integrate uh, renewable power basically and finally yeah of course when all these links are there you can make a dc grid and you can yeah that's the next foreign versus like future vision basically yeah and the next slide actually to give a illustrate i mean just just to show like how many gigawatts of uh, hvdc projects are installed uh, around the world yeah as I, yeah as I see like from last few years the growth is exponential basically the the growth is mostly coming from this uh, uh, renewable integration like in every country they want to they have a vision to uh, introduce a renewable uh, power into the grid therefore you see a lot of growth i mean because especially when you have a generation in far end and when offshore uh, yeah hvdc is a great tool actually it's like it enables you to integrate a huge volumes of power into the grid as you see like traditionally hvdc is used uh, to transmit power over longer distance uh, yeah this green uh, area this is like basically this is a yeah this is like mostly used for transmitting power uh, over long distances and this this yellow color here yeah this you see like the trend initially like before 20 uh, 2020 not so many uh, renewable integration projects and it's now it's picking up like so many projects are coming in this in this type of application uh, mostly in europe and a uh, few in U us also coming up now and you also see like the bottom the small thin portion yeah that is back to back converters and also nowadays we also seeing new application yeah this one is multi purpose interconnectors basically you build a hvdc converter a hvdc transmission link it uh, like it, do, it does two uh, applications like uh, bringing our uh, renewable power into the grid and same time you also like uh, bring uh, you interconnect to different grids yeah when there is a power in a, when renewable uh, plant is producing the power you bring into the grid when there is no power you also you uh, getting power from the neighboring country or neighboring grid it's like multi purpose but it is a like you, we have to have like multiple converters and uh, this is uh, just consolidated summary of the technology what we have been seeing in the industry from over the last 50 years I mean, 60 years or even more yeah yeah, uh, basically, uh, broadly, we can classify HVDC converters into two types. One is current source, one is voltage source. What it basically means, like when you are seeing from the grid, like converter is equivalent to current source in con current source uh, converters. When you're seeing from the grid, uh, this voltage source converter technology is basically, you see the voltage, uh, the converter is like uh, voltage source. Uh, that is briefly the, the difference. In, in current source uh, converters, uh, basically these converters are uh, based on uh, thigh resistors. And in, in uh, coming into the voltage source, these are, uh, the, these are uh, uh, IGBT based basically. Be, uh, both uh, do, uh, both uh, current source and uh, voltage source both do conversion, but they do bring different uh, they do have a different characteristics basically and those uh, characteristics you know uh, because of those characteristics you get different functionality out of these converters as i said uh, in uh, uh, current source converters yeah briefly we can again uh, classify them into line uh, commutator converters and also like capacitor capacitive commutator converters yeah, capacitor commutator converter, very similar to line commutator, but only thing is what we see the difference is it is uh, similar to series compensating capacitors. In uh, CCC converters, you also see uh, thyristor uh, bridge, plus you see also capacitor. Because, I mean, the main purpose of adding this capacitor in this type of conver converters is to optimize, uh, uh, to improve the functionalities, particularly when you are connecting line commutator converters to the grid. Yeah, they do uh, have some problems, especially when you uh, connect to the grid, uh, weak grids. Yeah, that 
is uh, uh, we, we can overcome these uh, problems with the capacitive uh, commutated converters. And whereas voltage source converters, there are like so many, uh, they evolved over the last 20, 30 years. Initially, the market, like the vendors were, uh, they started with two level converters and they later introduced cascaded two level converters and recently modular multi MMC converter. The MMC is like more advanced. Uh, it, it produces the, uh, the voltage output very uh, close to uh, uh, fundamental frequency. Yeah, that, uh, the other, uh, compared to other like past generation, this is like best uh, uh, with respect to the performance. And in, in MMC, you have again half bridge and full bridge. And nowadays we are seeing a lot of trend, like most of the applications are like half bridge based. And you also see the trend like uh, um, before 2020, you see a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, projects are based on LLC, LCC converters. And these converters are the main purpose is to transmit power like over a long distance between the grids. But as I said before, nowadays uh, the trend is changed. A lot of renewable power which you wanted to integrate into the grid. L LCC is not really compatible with the renewable generation. And therefore you see VSC uh, is coming into play. And most of the times you see VSC, uh, VSC uh, is being used by the clients actually. And these are some of the functionalities uh, with the con HVDC converters. To start with uh, the, uh, the blue color uh, highlighted here, the main functionality is the HVDC is for the power transmission and that you do have, you can get from both LCC and VSC. And same time, you also can, uh, you also can control reactive power output from LCC and VSC converters. And with VSC, uh, more than that, uh, more more than just real power and reactive power, we can also do a bit more actually. Yeah, probably I think if, uh, I'll go to the next one. We'll come. I think we first. And uh, these converters also can do uh, grid uh, support, especially like if you wanted uh, frequency frequency response. Like for example, if the frequency is going beyond uh, like. Yes, yeah, is, is uh, changing. Then you can uh, come uh, to bring back the frequency to the acceptable level. The, you can, uh, the automatically HVDC will control the power output out, output to the grid. And similarly, you can also use HVDC to you know, yeah. Uh, if for example, if you are connecting two grids uh, 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 with this HVDC, if there is an event in one of the grid, you can get support from remote grid like inertial support or uh, a spinning reserve support, like no need to have for each side. You can get from other side. That means HVDC can help to uh, compensate uh, to uh, to help the uh, uh, disturbance in the in the grid basically to to uh, to make a uh, uh, better power system. It, it can improve this power system operation. Similarly, we can also have like automatic like for, for HVDC, you can manually control the uh, the power flow in the HVDC. Otherwise, we can also do automatic setting. For example, we can uh, link, uh, like power, based on the events ha happening in the power system, it can derive power order to itself, basically. For example, as we said here, external power tracking control. Like, for example, if you wanted, uh, what we can do, we can monitor one, one particular line power flow. And when the power flow is increasing in that line, automatically, same time, you can also inc increase power, power flow in the HVDC. Basically, yeah. Basically, we are uh, distributing the power between HVDC and neighboring AC system, basically. And similarly, we can also use HVDC to improve the power quality. Like, for example, if there's a power oscillations in the network, HVDC can try to, uh, it, 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 can, it, it can modulate output power into the grid and thereby it can, uh, yeah, it can, uh, it can help to eliminate, the, uh, to reduce power, power oscillations. And similarly, HVDC, based on the events happening in the power system, it can automatically adjust its power, power flow. For example, if there is one line is lost in the grid, then it can see, oh, there is a line lost automatically, automatically it can uh, ramp down its power. And when the line is again back, it automatically can uh, increase the power flow into the grid. Basically, uh, it can do run back, run up, and it, 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 it can also do energy import export based on the events happening in the power system. 
And also, this can be this HVDC can can also be uh, used to uh, use for the market uh, reliability, I mean, grid reliability and market optimization, basically. And this this uh, I just wanted to just highlight uh, further to further to this uh, VSC can bring more benefits. Yeah, just yeah, few. I just wanted to only touch upon the few items here uh, because of the way a VSC uh, converter operates. It can be used to uh, for black starting the network, for example. Yeah, because it can uh, voltage source. It can uh, generate a voltage. Uh, it can generate a voltage, and that voltage we can use it to uh, energize the grid, and we can restore the network basically. And similarly, if, with a VSC, uh, because of the nature of the converter, how it operates, we can also change the power flow like n number of times. Whereas with the older technology, LCC, you can't do power flow rever power reversal, but VSC, you can do power, uh, power reversal like immediately if you want. And also VSC offers a one more benefit. We can connect the VSC converter to uh, weaker grids. Whereas in a, with legacy LCC converters, you have some problems. It cannot, we can't connect LCC converter with all, sort, all types of converters, all, all types of grids. Whereas VSC, yeah, we can connect to any type of grid. Well, we are quickly running through our time, so uh, we'll have to uh, uh, skip ahead a little bit, but this slide just shows you what is already in operation versus what is prototype, what is uh, fully qualified versus what's coming in. I mean, you see uh, in the lower left corner, these are the kind of uh, transfer capabilities and voltages that VSC uh, converters have be are operating on already the dark boxes and, and the light blue boxes are all the projects that are already planned. And what you can see here is on the right that quickly a two gigawatt 525 kV technology setting is becoming the standard. What you see on top with the bars is that, that some of these technologies that are now being planned to be deployed are not operating yet. So these are brand new technologies that have been fully tested and fully qualified, but there's definitely some um, new technology development that is going on as we speak. So we have a number of case studies in the report and I'll just give you a few examples. We have experience with the planning and procuring of HVDC transmission overlays. You know, we talked a lot about macro grid here in, in the US. It's that kind of stuff is happening already in Europe. Uh, we have experience with HVDC transmission in North America, of course. Um, and there's a lot of experience with the operational features that Chandra has just talked about. So all that controllability is being used in existing projects and being used very successfully. And then of course, uh, regional and interregional uh, market integration of HVDC transmission is going to be very important. Uh, you don't want to build something and then not use half of its capabilities. You know, HVDC is like a Swiss army knife. If all you need to do something to cut with, you might not buy a Swiss army knife, but if you want the other features, you're really glad to, to have it because the incremental cost is not that large. Um, I'll just give you a couple examples. Uh, one is in Germany. Germany is currently in the process of constructing about 10 gigawatts of HVDC projects between Northern Germany, Windridge area and Southern Germany, solar rich area. These are all sort of two gigawatt systems that will come online over the next um, several years. Um, one of them, the Ultranet project is particularly interesting because they are replacing one circuit of a multi-circuit AC line with DC technology. So they can use the same wires, the same towers, they need new um, insulators. But other than that, they can just you know triple the throughput capacity on that circuit by converting it to DC overhead. A lot of them are underground because um, of um, permitting issues. Uh, Tenet, uh, who is uh, the Dutch and partial German grid operator, they have just awarded 23 billion euros in contracts for 22 gigawatts of HVDC systems. They are betting on this card and they're procuring the equipment because um, you know there's some supply chain issues, of course, 
And Scottish uh, Southern Electricity Network is doing the same thing. They have just procured five sets of two gigawatt uh, HVDC systems to be delivered by, by 2030. So this is happening, this is coming, uh, except we are a little bit behind in the US as I will show you in a little bit. Same for the uh, Italian grid operator. They perhaps have the most experience with HVDC because they've used HVDC to connect to some of the islands um, that they have, but there are also several new HVDC projects, VSC-based HVDC projects that they are very happy with. And based on the lessons learned with these projects, they are now committed to an $11 billion hypergrid, which you see on the uh, map here. It's basically an overlay where um, a combination of HVDC lines, AC to HVDC conversion and upgrades of the AC line will create an overlay uh, that dramatically increases transfer capability throughout, throughout Italy. As of the experience with specific capabilities, um, there are many examples here, just a few of them. Uh, they're being used for frequency support and emergency energy. Uh, the auto closure for overline fault clearing has been tested. Um, the interesting thing about the bipole configuration is that if you have a fault, it usually affects only one of the poles. So unlike a AC line where the entire line goes down, if one of the pole has a short circuit with the bipole HVDC configuration, you only lose half of the capacity. The other uh, pole can keep operating. And importantly, even if you have a fault on the line, the converters can still pump reactive power in, into the systems. They don't need the line to, to be operating. Uh, of course, you can't transfer any uh, real power if that happens. There are runback schemes uh, to prevent overloading the AC line. So it's you can use the HVDC lines to protect the AC system. Um, you can uh, stabilize AC stability uh, constraints and improve transfer capabilities. Think uh, Eastern Texas to Western Texas or Western to Eastern Texas. And if you're worried about uh, not knowing how to operate an HVDC line, you can run it in AC line emulation. Basically the HVDC line is programmed to react exactly like an AC line. Uh, if that uh, as a system operator gives you some comfort while you learn how to use the advanced features. Power oscillations are becoming a big issue. You can use HVDC to dampen those. Black start system restoration. The UK is putting a lot of money into black start capabilities that are solely HVDC line focused. And finally, uh, it is possible to convert AC lines to DC lines. And in the US, uh, the blue lines here in North America, we have a lot of HVDC lines. Um, in some ways, California is probably leading that. The first, um, well, We've built long LLC lines, the blue lines, uh, decades ago. But California also has the first VSC HVDC line transfer cable in 2013. And they have a lot of operational experience with that. They are now in the transmission planning, have been evaluating 10 HVDC systems. They've approved two. Um, but importantly, they have changed their market engine so the market can fully co-optimize HVDC dispatch and actually uh, phase shift the dispatch with the generation dispatch. None of the other system operators in the US can currently do that. If you're, if you're an HVDC line in MISO, you have to self-schedule because the market system is not uh, sophisticated enough to optimize an HVDC line. Um, the West is also uh, optimizing transmission, including HVDC interregionally in the energy imbalance market. And Kaleiser has just filed a subscriber PTO proposal that would allow merchant transmission lines to be integrated into uh, the day ahead and, and real-time market. But it is also clear that most of the proposed projects, the red ones on here, are proposed by merchant lines and offshore wind developers, not system operators. I think this has to change because we can use this technology to address many of the system reliability challenges that the system operators are now talking about, such as stability concerns. Um, Chandra, do you want to take yeah. us 
briefly through the next yeah. slides. Yeah. Yeah, just to this slide, just want to show that uh, the various phases of studies which we we, we have to take, uh, we have to perform during the H, uh, for this HVDC project. So start with uh, phase one, phase two, phase three. These are typically done by utility or ISO or you know, TSOs. They will do like from client side. You have uh, these studies are performed. These are like more market studies in phase one, in phase two, system impact studies. And phase three, when everything, yeah, when the client is clear what he wants to buy, in phase three, you will have to do some more studies to define parameters to the vendors. And then from there, like phase four, phase five, phase six, a lot of studies, like various studies are done by vendors to design the product, to design, uh, to rate the components, to, to design the controllers. Uh, to do a test in the factory system, factory during the pack in the factory, and then going into the commissioning. Yeah, these are the various phases of uh, various various phases in the studies, basically. And there is this uh, technical report, IEEE uh, technical report, T uh, TR eighty six. It very detailed detailedly explains all these phases, basically. And this is also one more uh, way of presenting, uh, just to show like uh, the various studies we have to perform. Uh, in uh, various phases of the projects, uh, in HVDC uh, project, in, in planning st planning stage, yeah, we had to do market analysis. Yeah, that study covers like years to uh, like year, like over years. Like we had to uh, to develop a business case based on the projection forecast and everything. And one once we are happy, yeah, go to steady state analysis where you do like in system impact studies uh, to make sure everything is okay with the power system. And the same time, when yeah, you do that, yeah, you go to uh, again like stability studies, just to m make sure that whatever you're introducing into the grid, it's not bringing any, yeah, any uh, uh, bad performance or behavior. When when you're happy, yeah, you go and uh, go to the next stage, where as part of when you are developing the uh, like detailed uh, product, or uh, you do a lot of EMT simulations, uh, EMT studies. And then, yeah, when it is done, you go to real-time simulator studies, which you do like when everything control system and product is ready, you go to real-time simulators and you make sure you test everything. Uh, all the performances are okay and the controller is for, uh, uh, behaving as you want. And then you go to real, you know, system energization, basically. And uh, the thing is, basically, all these studies you have to, it's not a same model. We have to use a model based on what we are trying to achieve, like, the first three phases, you don't need a detailed HVDC model. Yeah, you start with generic, simple model, and then you do all these studies. And then going forward, like when you are really going uh, uh, into the project stage, you do develop control system based on like detailed model, detailed HVDC uh, vendor specific models. Yeah, basically that's it. Uh, that's just to show like various phases of the studies in the project, HVDC project. Yeah, uh, we won't spend too much time on this, but part of a uh, big part of uh, transmission planning, of course, is the reliability studies that John Rush just talked about. But if you really want to take advantage of HVDC, you have to do a multi-value planning process. You have to figure out how much are those other features of the Swiss Army knife worth, worth to you. And whether it's flow control optimization or dynamic reactive power control along uh, distance transfer, reduced losses, uh, controlling congestion on the AC grid, stability, this all has value. And the question is, you may not need that right away, but how valuable is this? And we have a lot of experience on how to quantify the economic value of these features. And that kind of valuation has to be reflected in the benefit cost analysis. Uh, Europe has a continent-wide benefit cost framework where everyone uses the same benefit metrics, uh, the same benefit cost analysis, and HVDC-related benefits are explicitly part of that benefit cost framework. We need to do that here, otherwise we won't understand when HVDC uh, is more cost-effective, even though it, it might cost more. But sometimes you have to spend money to save money but to figure that out, you have to use this kinds of benefit cost analysis. Um, but getting there is really hard because we have a lot of misconceptions and maybe we can run through some of these misconceptions. This is what we hear from system operators, from, uh, from clients, things they are concerned about. 
Yeah, this one just wanted to highlight like what are the misconceptions around the in the industry about uh, HVDC and VSC basically, and just want to give a feedback. I mean, just our view. Yeah, VSC. I mean, one conception is like a misconception. VSC is not matured. Like as 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 I was showing in earlier slides, there were so many projects. Maybe yeah, maybe fifty or sixty projects already in operation, and few more, twenty thirty more in under construction. And uh, uh, like people also ask question about uh, VSC, uh, the converter reliability and availability, and they're matured. And I think our colleague is going to present like real time data uh, on this reliability and availability. And again, uh, like VSC converters are earlier version, like old converters, like first generation converters. They used to, yeah, the losses used to be very high with those converters. Now the converters are like very efficient actually, and in, they are in on par with uh, LCC converters. And also, when one conception is like, oh, uh, when you place con converters next to each other. Uh, is not reliable. Of course, this techno this particular thing is not measured, but there are projects. Com uh, we are gaining commercial uh, project uh, project experiences. There are, there were like a couple of projects like yeah where converters are placed next to each other, and there were like a lot of studies done, and uh, uh, the control system is improved and uh, uh, slightly modified, and they are in operation. We are gaining ex uh, experience in that as well, and yeah, VSC technology is uh, compatible with overhead lines. And VSC, the HVDCs can restart. Uh, like when the fault is there, you shut down and you come back. Like auto reclosing, it can do same, uh, same like AC systems. But of course, we have to. Uh, there is a discussion on the like how fast, how slow. That is a discussion is going on. And then next one is like more about uh, uh, equipment withstanding to the lightning uh, uh, surges. Basically, again, this is not a problem. Many converters being designed and they put into operation. And uh, yeah, I mean, as we as I told uh, like a couple of seconds before, MM, uh, VSC, yeah, it is compatible with overhead lines. It can handle the temporary faults. And yeah, the, we also can like if the client wants, he can also request uh, uh, as when he's buying the asset, he can also request for an overload capability. Sometimes we, we do get like free like inherent capability. Sometimes we have to take into con uh, design considerations. And next is like uh, the behavior of the converters during the fault events, uh, like during the over voltage or under voltage. I think again, this area is like very matured actually, uh, like many projects in the Europe uh, were delivered uh, uh, based on these uh, requirements. And uh, VSC, I mean, HVDC, uh, there are, uh, it can also help uh, 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 to support the black start basically. The, in projects in the Europe, they they in operation they, they were like VSC converters utilized to restore the networks. There are like like real examples from the Europe in in this front. And HVDC is a circuit breaker. Yes, when we are going to multi terminal, for sure we need a DC breaker. This area is evolving. We don't have a yeah a lot of experience, but things are evolving. And of course, yeah, tech, HVDC technology is more complicated. That's for sure. Like. It's complicated, yeah, we are getting a lot of learning and things are becoming better. Yeah, and this uh, just wanted to show here, uh, like, yeah, we have some challenges like uh, deploying HPDC projects actually. Just I wanted to highlight here, what are the various challenges we see in the industry? The first, just to start with the, uh, the standards, like many of the standards in the North America, like are based on the LCC technology and it doesn't consider all these uh, bene benefits what we get from VSC and uh, the latest converter topologies and all. And yeah, there are some, there are no standards for some of the uh, components like cables, HVDC cables. And yeah. And also there was like IEEE standard. It it doesn't not ex, uh, not intense. Uh, uh, it doesn't cover all the uh, uh, all types of HVDC configurations and application. It does cover like part of the uh, uh, part of the topol uh, part of the uh, uh, topologies. But yeah, we have to again put like efforts to uh, make a standard to cover all aspects of the all types of HVDCs. Again, there are like there is no uh, there are some gaps uh, with respect to like. Uh, uh, performance, design, health and safety. It's, they, they are not like HVDC is not well integrated with all these aspects. 
there is also there are there are a lot of gaps actually we have to go through all these gaps to uh, uh, yeah that will really help to uh, implement these projects basically and one more challenge is uh, supply chain this is nowadays is like a yeah, huge uh, problem in the industry uh, yeah demand is going crazy like all over the world like a lot of uh, demand for this uh, off uh, renewable integration and therefore hvdc and the pro main challenge here is we do have very limited number of suppliers in the industry and also of course yeah like if you go back to a few years before like the, uh, the these vendors were doing like yearly one or two projects therefore all these manufacturing lines engineering staff and all all the facilities were like meant for only doing one or two projects here now suddenly everything is ramped up and uh, yeah that's a that's a big challenge and technology maturity also is uh, like some of the, as uh, hannes was showing yeah some of the products yeah we don't have a lot of exp a lot of maturity yeah this 525 kv uh, 2 gigawatt converters is yeah there is a experience but we don't have a lot of ex maturity yeah we now we are under a learning curve actually uh, the projects are being implemented in the europe and the one thing is like country of uh, vendors origin that also is a challenge like you know every country got uh, their own uh, export uh, import restrictions like they don't accept from some countries that's also is a, a serious challenge actually and uh, if you want to take this yeah, no, supply chain challenges are a problem with European uh, grid operators ordering 40 gigawatts worth of HVDC lines. Uh, if you ordered one now, uh, it wouldn't get delivered until after 2030. So we have about seven year uh, delivery time right now until manufacturing can ramp up. I mean, it's not unique to HVDC. Large power transformers take at least four years for, for delivery. So uh, it is a real challenge. Um, on, on the technology side, I, I want to say that in North America, the industry right now is looking at HVDC and interconnection standards said in a very defensive way. What can we do to make sure HVDC isn't screwing up the AC system? That is not a mindset that takes advantage of the capabilities of, of the um, HVDC system. So I think we, as we look at these standards, we need to make sure not only how can we integrate HVDC reliably, but also how can we design those standards so we can actually take advantage of the capabilities? That is really important. And on the planning market design and challenges, we don't have good uh, multi-value transmission planning processes that would naturally uh, consider the benefits that HVDC provides to the system because we are so reliability oriented and addressing the near-term reliability need, you don't need HVDC for that. You can get by, but in the long term, HVDC can get you to a lower cost solution. And that is really important. So what are our recommendations to close up? We need to develop an increment grid codes, uh, just as Europe has done to allow grid operators to take full advantage of HVDC capabilities. Uh, obviously we need to adapt our planning tools and multi-value planning process to take advantage of those capabilities. We need a lot of training. There's a lot of experience that uh, this technology requires. Uh, we have on one of the slides, some training materials and, and, and training references. Uh, there's a lot of experience out there. Um, you know, we often hear, well, it's so complicated. Why can't we make HVDC as simple as AC? Nothing is simple about AC. We just got used to the complexity of running a continent-wide AC grid. It's really complicated. In some ways, HVDC makes it simpler because you can actually control it. You can switch it on, you can switch it off, you can ramp it. That controllability ultimately makes things simpler. But of course, it's like running a town with traffic lights. You need to learn how to program those traffic lights before you get the benefit of more efficient traffic flow. Supply chain challenges, big issue. DOE is trying to help. Um, and standardization is gonna be important. What voltage levels are we gonna use? What size levels are we gonna use? What are the uh, inter-vendor compatibility standards? And we need to have regulatory paradigms that take advantage of this capability as well. So, um, the grid operators will have to learn how to operate these things. 
Uh, and we need to change, we need to modernize our market design so the markets can actually take advantage of HVAC capability. CalISO is already doing it since 2017. New York ISO is updating its market design to be ready when the next HVDC line comes in, but the other system operators are not yet capable of, of optimizing HVDC. And we need to look to optimize interregional transmission, not just HVDC. All interregional transmission is poorly optimized right now. And we have a separate report on, on that, but accommodating all these merchant lines that are being developed is important if you want to take full advantage of the value that they bring to the system. And that requires a lot of collaboration between the transmission owners and developers, the HPDC equipment manufacturers, NERC, industry groups, regulators, the states have an important role to play here, and the US Department of Energy and International Labs. So that's our overview. Uh, James, do we have questions now or do we go into the next presentation? All right, well, thank you, Hannes and Chandra. Okay, um, so um, quick introduction. I can start with my name. I'm uh, from working with uh, Siemens Energy since uh, more than 15 years um, um, in the area of the HVDC transmission. And I kind of uh, started directly uh, with, uh, uh, with a new, by the time it was a new technology for the HVDC, the VSC HVDC. And so I will give you a kind of a, a vendor perspective on the HVDC technology and focusing mostly on the VSC HVDC. So, uh, I mean, we have heard a lot about um, HVDC. So I would like to start quickly with the introduction VSC HVDC technologies, uh, make a comparison between VSC and LCC, looking at different topologies and give a kind of a, a small insight into the uh, control principles of an HVDC system. Um, so yeah, uh, starting with the VSC HVDC, I think we have uh, what we have just heard is that, um, yeah, this is the technology to go with. And, uh, but I think this is a kind of uh, talking to people, there is a, some misunderstanding. What is a VSC HVDC technology actually? And I like to start with this one. So it's all kind of uh, started with trains. So what what has the train uh, system, uh, electrical train system, has to do with um, uh, VSC HVDC technology? And actually, um, yeah, it's um, on the setup of the converter. So this is the heart of every HVDC system. So the train systems, they are well the first ones we came with is uh, six pulse bridge technology. So the idea was to control um, the AC output uh, with a DC source. So, and this was the basic principle for the first uh, generation of the VSC HVDC technology. So the idea was that we have uh, certain IGBTs, uh, which is uh, to connect them in series. And this is the idea how two level and three level converters have been built. So this is the technology that has started in the 90s. And um, the biggest challenge in this setup was if you have so many IGBTs connected in series and you have a failure in one of the IGBTs, what you would like to avoid, you would like to avoid that you lose the full transmission uh, power. So the key feature that was required by the time was um, let's call it a controllable IGBT failure. That means in case if one of these IGBT fails, looking here, one of these IGBT fails, that the converter still will be able to operate. That means IGBT needs to form a short circuit by the time um, when it fails. The problem by the times in the 90s at the beginning of the thousand years is that there was only one IGBT supplier who had this feature. And this IGBT supplier was a company, ABB, and they, they said, oh, they were not selling this IGBTs freely on the market, but was uh, were selling the whole HVDC systems. And this two and three level technology, which has started in the 90s, kind of uh, was limited to one supplier. Um, so it was, uh, so what was the key feature of this two and three level technology was um, that we had very high switching frequency, more than two kilohertz, high switching impulses, high, um, high frequency filters, high losses. 
and um, yeah, and the serious connection of the IGBDs. So, um, and we were talking before about misunderstanding about the VSCH VDC technology. And many of these misunderstandings come directly from this time, from the 90s, where we had two or three level converter technologies. So the change was made uh, with the introduction of the modular multi-level converter or MMC. So what was the idea? The idea was that instead of having a centralized storage and connecting the uh, IGBTs in series, um, the idea was to distribute the energy storage in submodules. That means, and this is the submodule that you see here. So we kind of break up the central, the big um, converter with many uh, IGBTs in series to bring, in, uh, yeah, kind of a divide in small pieces, and this piece is called submodule. So by this division in small, we have a completely different approach. First of all, we can use standard industrial LGBTs. So, and um, in case of a fault, it was a, the kind of a main design design criteria previously, uh, we had instead of, let's say, having this IGBT fail safe um, capability, we have now a mechanical switch as shown here, which can create a bypass. So, and this was, let's say a very, the, the crucial change in the complete, let's say, design of the converters. So the first um, modular multi-level um, converter was introduced in um, 2010, and the first converter, as I already mentioned, was built here in California in the um, uh, Transbay, it's a Transbay Cable Project, which is in San Francisco Bay Area. And the good thing is that this technology it had so many advantages that all the suppliers that are kind of uh, picked up um, this technology um, time after time. Um, kind of, I'm saying, uh, kind of being also from Siemens, uh, the company who developed it, I say we did a pretty good job in developing it, uh, but we, we did a pretty bad job in terms of the patents. So this technology was not properly patented. It was patented in Germany only, but all the other countries, they were have not I don't know why NOS patent was submitted, but I think it was pretty bad for the company. It was pretty good for the market because all the suppliers could use this technology um, everywhere uh, in the world. And this is a kind of a help uh, the development um, of this technology. So let's kind of a um, kind of a quick uh, comparison two and three level uh, uh, converters versus the MMC. As said before, special LGBTs with so-called short on fail capability are required, uh, which is not the case for the MMC where standard industrial LGBTs can be used. Uh, we have very high switching frequencies for the three and three level converters, um, and we have very small uh, switching frequencies. And these results in losses also. Uh, we have two or three level converters. We have um, very high losses, which are 1.4, 1.5%. In the MMC technology, we can go down to 0.7% of losses, converter losses. It's very important when we're talking about the losses, we're talking about the whole station losses. That means transformer, converter, all the auxiliary pumps, cooling pumps, yeah, handling units, and so on. Um, we have, we for the MMC technology, we don't need any high frequency filters. Um, this can be avoided by design. Uh, we have a very easy scaling of DC voltages. Uh, we have significantly reduced harmonics. It's, um, harmonics are a big issue. Do we need harmonics? Yes or not? Um, I would say MMC technology as itself does not need um, any filters because the MMC technology is uh, can provide very poor sinusoidal voltage. The pro but the, problem, um, the issue that you have to keep in mind is that there is not only generation, there is also amplification of the background harmonics. So if there are already harmonics in the network, in the AC grid, which is the case in most cases, an HVDC system, especially MMC system, can amplify this existing harmonics. And this is what we are looking at. Um, so in many cases, it's not re required because of the generation, because, because of the amplification. This is a kind of, a, let's say, a completely change in mind, because uh, especially here in US, we're looking more on the current harmonics instead of the voltage harmonics, uh, where I'm saying, okay, but 
we need also the background harmonic. We need to know what is existing in the network to evaluate the harmonic uh, capability. We have high reliability and we also have high power ratings uh, with projects and execution with more than three gigawatt power transmission capability. If we look here, there are pictures of three different converters. So this is how the converter looks like. This is um, um, the MMC converter, how they look like. And I think this is a picture showing from three different suppliers, uh, the major suppliers which are available in the Western market. And all of them are using now MMC. Um, the mechanical setup can be slightly different. So either the converters can be standing on the ground or hanging on from the roof. So the, this is a just, a, let's say, a kind of a, a mechanical difference um, in the building up of the converters, but the functionality of these converters, it's um, actually very similar. And which is a pretty big help because now we kind of, uh, um, let's say, I remember seven years ago, it was a kind of a big discussion because one supplier, we as Siemens Energy, we had MMC, other suppliers had different technology and we had big fights, which is the superior, what is the better one. But right now it's kind of uh, the whole industry is working really on one technology and everybody said, okay, it's more or less agreed that this is the standard um, to go for. Um, one of the looking at the reliability, and this is also one of the kind of key features. Um, here is an overview of the reliability and availability of the um, yeah, uh, Siemens Energy HVDC systems. The two key numbers uh, to look for is, as we call it, forced energy and availability and the forced outage rate. So what does it mean? Forced outage rate means how many times does the converter fail during one year? Is it one time, two times, etc.? The other one is the forced energy and availability saying if it fails, how long does it take to restart it or how long does it take to repair the fault? So um, this means um, these are the two key numbers. So we want to say how much, how often does it fail? And if it fails, how long does it take to restart uh, the system? Uh, how much time? So and the key features, uh, key numbers to look at, and this is uh, shown here in the green. Um, so what we see right now is a factor of first outage rate of two. That means a converter fails up to two times a year. And, uh, and the total or looking over a year, 0.5% of the time, the converter is not available due to the forced energy. So un, unscheduled, unscheduled uh, failure or unscheduled unavailability. Um, and this is an overview of the all HVDC fleet um, that you can see. So as you can see, the, fur, the majority of the systems are here in the left corner. This is what we want to, the systems to be. That means we want to uh, don't want our converters to fail, and we if they fail, we want to have them restarted, being pretty uh, pretty quickly. Um, one of the let's say kind of what we did uh, when we started, we had a statistic for the VSC and for the LCC technology separately. At some point, we realized it doesn't make any sense because the rates are very very similar, and the reason for this one is that majority of the failures are not to this let's say kind of a very specific VSC or LCC specific parts like the converter itself. No, the most failures are coming from auxiliary systems, control and protection systems, which are very similar. So this is why we say, okay, the difference is actually not that big. So we can use, let's say the same overview, which is from my point of view, it's a, such a great achievement that has been made during the industry during the last years, because LCC, we have uh, several decades of experience and the VSC, we just have, let's say, around about 10 years of experience. Now we have reaching the same failure rates, the same availability as with the um, SSC technology. And, and the good thing is, and this is kind of also helping the industry. I mean, I can tell you how oh, our uh, system is so reliable, we are so great, and so on. The good thing is that the majority of the VSC operational data is publicly available. Like, for example, the TANET, the the Dutch German TSO who is operating the majority of the VSC system. They are forced by the law to publish the availability of the of their system and also availability of the HVDC system. Whenever there is a failure in the HVDC system, they have published it on the on the website. So everybody can look up and say, hey, 
what is Siemens Energy telling me? How is the reliability of the system? It's absolutely transparent. So everybody can tell, you can look up and to see uh, how the numbers really are. And they are pretty good. I think they are looking on the uh, time of operation, the experience. I think we can be uh, pretty happy uh, with the performance that we see. And then, of course, I mean, we have been talking via CLCC. And um, so what are the kind of uh, the, the key differences? Um, I mean, once again, LCC stands for line commutated converter, VSC voltage source converter. To be exactly, it's a force commutated converter. So that means we have line commutated converter and force commutated converter, but I think the VSC is a most common one. Um, the terristors, which have a only turn on capability, IGBTs, we have turn on and turn off capability. And this is one of the key factors. We have an energy storage capability. If we're looking at the looking at this uh, converter, looking here on this setup and so on, I would say 80% of the space required are the capacitors is for the energy storage. So many of the features that we see in the VSC technology are not coming only from the IGBTs, but especially also from the energy storage um, capability of the VSC converter. Uh, for there, we don't need a reactive power compensation requirement. Uh, we can operate in a very uh, weak network with the VSC technology up to the islanded network. Um, a few years ago, there was a big, let's say, issue saying, okay, uh, for the if we want to have high power, anything above two gigawatts, uh, we need to go with the LCC. I think this is also obsolete. We have new IGBTs technologies, so-called Prespec IGBTs, freely available on the market, uh, We have which have similar current ratings as terrestrials. So there is actually no limit for the VSC technology anymore. Uh, what we manage also with the VSC is to kind of uh, to reduce the losses. So we are more now in the, the same uh, losses range as the LCC technology. Um, and this is a kind of a, a two, let's say for building up the network and was the question. So uh, how, if we're gonna go multi-terminal for the LCC, if we wanna change the power flow direction. So we are going from say, uh, transmit from station one to station B, and we want to change the direction power flow. What we needed to do in the uh, in LCC is uh, to change the DC voltage polarity, um, which is, I mean, for the point to point, it's straightforward. It's not an issue. As soon as you're building up a um, multi terminal and you want to have a flexibility in the power flow direction, this becomes a problem. And this is where the VSC technology kind of uh, uh, has the big advantage because it does not change the DC voltage polarity but it is a changing DC current direction. One of the, let's say, kind of a big advantages of the LCC still remains is the inherent DC fault clearance capability. So that means if we have a DC line fault, it's very easy for the LCC to clear the fault. For the VSC technology, we either need so-called full bridge uh, setup which is kind of a talk about this one a little bit uh, later. We need DC breakers or we can do it with the AC breakers. That means we have a slightly increased fault clearing times with the AC breakers, but the DC fault clearing capability with the standard, um, let's say, uh, VSC technology is not as good with the LCC. Um, one point you will not find here is the costs. Uh, so we were comparing with the costs because Cost it highly depends on the existing network configuration. Um, I think the big advantage of the VSC is it's, it's capable to operate in very, very weak networks or even islanded networks, which is not possible for the LCC. For the LCC, we require um, a high short circuit ratio. That means the ratio between the uh, power of the HVDC station and availability uh, available short circuit uh, power of the network. And um, so that means if we consider the network enhancement uh, for the LCC technology, this usually, let's say, flips the uh, kind of uh, the coin. That means in, in what's we'll say in the most, far most cases, VSC technology is, by, um, is cheaper because uh, it can be easily integrated in the network. And one other point to consider is that if we're looking um, on the lifetime of the VSC system, so 30 to 35 years, and the network changes that can happen during these years, um, the 
a VSC technology kind of provides more security in terms of the uh, operation lifetime. And considering this cost uh, altogether usually gives the VSC a significant um, advantage. Another point is uh, now com coming kind of uh, of the configuration of the topologies because this is also kind of a very crucial kind of uh, application saying, okay, we have a VSC, but how we do we make a system out of this one? Um, look, we are uh, kind of uh, looking at different configurations and one is saying, okay, um, as mentioned before, to transmit the power uh, over DC, we need just two conductors and two converters. And this is the simplest uh, topology as we can get. So that means, and this is uh, the call, topology called symmetrical monopole. So symmetrical monopole, that means we have two converters, two conductors, and the power being uh, transmitted in both directions and having all the flexibility, etc. cetera. Um, so this is probably the symmetrical monopole is one of the, let's say, most common configurations that you see right now in the market. And we have the first Transpay Cable project, Allegro, Nemo, Eleklink. There are many, many projects already being built, already in the execution, uh, which is um, uh, we have experience with. Um, so the limitation of the power limitation is not kind of um, is not due to the converter design itself, but it's mostly due to the uh, single contingencies that we see in the AC grids. So if we have a single contingency in the AC grid, then we lose, then the, the power of this converter should not be higher than the single contingency. So this is why kind of uh, this is the limit that we see in the market being right about 1.3 gigawatt, which is the um, yeah maximum single contingency limit in many areas also here in US. Um, if you want to increase the power, uh, one of the ways to go is that we, as we call it, to build as a dual symmetrical monopole. That means uh, building two uh, converters, two symmetrical monopoles, more or less in parallel. From the operator point of view, they consider this well, as one as one unit, as one, for example, if you have every unit is uh, two gigawatts, you consider this one as a two gigawatt uh, system. From the operator point of view, it's uh, just a two gigawatt system. But which of course brings gives you additional uh, redundancy. So in case of a fold, you still can operate with uh, fifty percent um, of the power. The disadvantage, of course, you need four converters, and you need uh, four um, four conductors. Uh, but also some of the let's say operators like um, uh, prefer uh, this uh, configuration. So there are uh, two projects that has been realized with this configuration, like in Alpha in Alpha One PK two thousand. In Alpha 1, it's uh, France and Spain, PK2000, it's in India. And now in Alpha 2 project, also in construction, is also using the same um, topology. Um, so what is the specific advantage of this technology? Let's uh, having a, looking at the DC voltage 320 kV, this is the most common voltage. And the big advantage is that looking at here, we have here we have plus 320 kV, minus 320 kV. And looking on the AC voltage, we see an AC voltage um, with no DC voltage offset. So we have plus 320, minus 320, and um, zero DC voltage at the AC side. The big advantage is, uh, there are two advantages, that all the equipment, the maximum voltage, that means, oh, sorry, um, that the voltage here acting as a DC voltage is actually 640 kV, uh, but uh, you break it up into uh, in plus 320 and minus 320. That means uh, for all the equipment design that you have, like the bushings, spray actors, DC cables, uh, DC cable ceiling ends, and so on, are designed for 320 kVs. And we don't have a DC voltage stress on the converter side of the transformer. This is a very, let's say, key feature of the symmetrical monopole. So, because all the LCC configurations that we see, they have, this is, I will explain uh, in a minute why, they have here a DC voltage offset. That means a specific equipment is then required. So this is why sometimes we are talking about um, HVDC transformers which is not the case, is you're using a symmetrical monopole configuration, 
you don't you can use standard ac transformers ac interface transformers which makes let's say a big difference also looking at the supply chain of course uh, hvdc transformer is more difficult to manufacture the you need a specific more insulation etc but this is not the case for the symmetrical um, monopole so looking at them what is the other configuration as a rigid bipole? Um, rigid, bi oh, sorry, a bipole configuration. Bipolar configuration is born of the idea of saying, okay, we need a little bit more redundancy uh, so in the system. So one of the, let's say, key features will be say, okay, I will build a system consisting of um, four H uh, HVDC converters, three conductors. And this is a called bipole with dedicated metallic return, DMR. That means um, I have a three conductor setup. So we have uh, projects like Ultranet, Grain Belt Express, which are using a three conductor technology. The big advantage of these bipolar configurations is that in case of a converter fault or a cable fault, you still can operate with at least 50% uh, of, the, of the transmission power. So this is good. This is exactly what we want to have, that in a single fold, we are not losing the full transmission capability. Um, the third conductor, this dedicated metallic return, I would say in the lifetime of the HVDC converter, 99% of the time, it is not in operation. So the idea was then born to say, okay, uh, we kind of uh, re replace it by an earth electrode. That means earth electrode means we don't build a third conductor uh, but we installed earlier electrodes. So if this conductor is needed, we're going to uh, transmit the power through the earth. Um, so we have also being AVC converters being built like Attic Accrete, like Terranian Link now under construction, so which are can utilize uh, this uh, technology. So they, you have more or less, let's say, the same functionality as dedicated metallic return, but you save the third conductor. So you're you're saving uh, in costs in the transmission uh, line are significant. The big disadvantage, of course, of this earth electrode is that um, it's environmental issues, uh, which might not allow uh, the construction of this um, earth electrode. Um, but it's still it's still happening. So it's still possible, even let's say in very populated areas like in Europe, um, like Attica Creed, um, it's a connection between the island of Crete and the mainland Creek. It's being built, Tarrani Link in, in Italy. So this technology is um, yeah, still, still available. And um, let's say the third bipolar configuration is a called rigid bipole. And rigid bipole, we kind of uh, we remove the dedicated metallic return by don't install, install an earth electrode because it's probably not allowed. And uh, we are operating, let's say, with four converters and two conductors. Um, so, of course, you get some redundancy in terms of the uh, converters, but you don't have any, let's say, uh, redundancy in um, uh, in terms of a DC cable. So, in case of a DC uh, cable or DC line fold, you're losing the full uh, transmission power. But nevertheless, this is probably one of the most popular configurations right now. So uh, the two gigawatt projects that has been presented uh, by Johannes um, in Germany are using this rigid bipolar configuration. But looking at this bipolar configuration, uh, we have uh, the same picture as we have seen before. So saying, hey, we want to transmit, we want to have the same DC voltage of 640 kV. We have in the bipolar, we have always um, an earning system, so that means we have here zero, that one um, part is around about uh, zero kilovolts, the other one is this application will be 640 kV. So what is the main, what does it mean? That means um, for the bipolar systems, uh, we need a higher, um, let's say, a rating, voltage rating of all the DC equipment. Um, right now we are not using 640 kV, uh, but we are using 525 kV. So from the converter point of view, it's no difference. The converter still is producing 640 kV. You're, you're going to have the same converter for the symmetrical monopole or for this bipolar system. But all the other equipment like DC transmission, um, cable or ceiling ends, reactors, all the DC equipment is, um, is designed for this um, uh, higher voltage. 
And the other one is on this AC equipment, you will get a certain uh, DC voltage offset. So, and this, what does it mean is that all the equipment installed here, it has to handle the AC voltage stress plus the DC voltage stress. One of the main um, influence it has on the transformer, as mentioned before, we need a, a specific uh, transformer. And one other part is all the other AC equipment. We don't have so much, so it's mean you don't have so much equipment installed, but there is a pretty big kind of a um, impact it has on the offshore applications. All the offshore converters for transmitting power from the offshore wind uh, to the land being used so far is symmetrical monopole. And so to make it, let's say, a very compact uh, converter design, you're using GIS systems. It's very easy to use, for example, also on this one, on this AC side, you can use an a, an a GIS system. You don't have a DC voltage offset. As soon as you've got going to the bipolar operation, this is what is being used right now in Europe. You've got a problem because, I mean, you need an equipment, a, a GIS system, which is capable to get to handle AC and DC voltage stress. And this kind of becomes a challenge because this um, kind of equipment is not approved. Of course, we have built so many, let's say, uh, bipolar system. All the LCC systems are kind of a bipolar system, very well known, but none of these have been ever used a GIS system in combination. So this is a kind of a, a new area of application uh, where we say, okay, yeah, um, of course you can go IES. This is what has been done also in this, all these um, new kind of a project, they're going instead of GIS, they're going IES, air insulated switch gear, but which results of course in a significantly um, bigger size. So these are kind of a, these are aspects of looking, let's say on the um, differences, symmetrical monopole bipolar system and saying, okay, it's not like, yeah, it's different topology, but also the type of the equipment being used is uh, kind of um, uh, different. So. Just a kind of a, a quick uh, overview. So what we're looking at, symmetrical monopole, rigid bipole, or bipole with metallic return, or bipole with el electrode, kind of a summarizing the availability and as had, symmetrical monopole is the most cheap, uh, the cheapest solution that you can think of, but it is, um, let's say, has no redundancy. The DC voltage, maximum DC voltage that has been used in this configuration is plus minus 400 kV. There've been a few projects, um, well, uh, under execution or being built uh, with this DC voltage, the most common voltage is 320 kV, um, and the resulting maximum power is 1400 megawatt, 1500 megawatt. And as I said, it's mostly limited due to the single contingency or the DC cable limitations. The rigid bipole um, and the bipolar configuration, all the most common DC voltage that we're using is um, more than 500 kV, 525, 600 kV, depending on the requirements. But then also the maximum power that we can reach with the bipolar system is more than uh, three gigawatts. A very quick one um, on the bipolar operation modes. Um, the bipolar system kind of uh, has a lot of um, uh, flexibility. So the most common operating mode, as we call it, is a balance mode. That means we have the, the system being connected at one side, at the other side to the uh, same AC grid. That means uh, we have um, a some balance operation. Balance operation, we have no current going uh, through the DMR, through a dedicated metallic return. This is, let's say, the losses optimized operation and so on. So what we can do is, and in case of a fall, uh, we automatically switch to the mono, uh, monopolar operation. The monopolar operation is that the current um, is going through the DMR. That means, for example, in case of a fault uh, in this here, in this lower pole, is that you can still operate uh, with the remaining um, pole. And what is usually done, if, for example, if you are running in the balance mode with just of 50% power transmission capability and you have a fault in the monopolar system, you can ramp up the power in the remaining pole to compensate um, a, a loss of pole if, if uh, possible. And one of the kind of uh, also features of the bipolar systems is a called um, and split uh, bus power operation and unbalanced mode, which means uh, that at some at one side uh, the bipoles are connected to one AC grid, by the other side they can be connected to different um, AC grid. So these AC grids don't need to be actually synchronized. 
It can be different unsynchronized or different parts of the same uh, AC grids, which not supposed to be connected. So this gives a kind of a, a flexibility in the operation. That means at one side, if you have us uh, collect the energy and transmitting, but you want to feed the energy into the different uh, pieces. So you don't need to build, let's say kind of a two systems. You can still run um, with one bipolar system, but connect um, at, at the other end uh, to do uh, two different um, AC grids. Um, in the rigid bipolar operation modes, it's a kind of a, a very similar. You, you can also have a common bus power operation, uh, split operation. And one of the, let's say, kind of also features in the um, rigid bipolar, and this has been mentioned before, is in case of a converter fault, you can reconfigure, you can bypass here, as I've shown here, the faulty converter, and then you can uh, transmit um, still, let's say, at, at least 50% of the power. So you've got a redundancy in the converter itself, um, but that, as I said, not in the uh, DC line itself. The only problem, uh, the big difference is that this configuration from the bipolar operation mode here, and we have a we dedicated metallic return to the monopolar operation. This kind of um, changeover happens instantly. There, you don't need any reconfiguration, so it it happens pretty fast. Um, here in this reconfiguration, coming from this operation mode to this one, the reconfiguration it takes uh, more uh, than one second because there are a few kind of uh, let's say. Um, yeah, DC switches uh, needs mechanical DC switches that needs to be operated, and this is a kind of a, yeah something to take into account in the configuration of the network stability and so on. If the rigid bipole, you have a, a less redundancy, and the reconfiguration in case of a fault um, takes a, a more than one second. Now, uh, I was wondering, Oigen, because we have gone one layer uh, below what. Uh, Anis and Chandra covered. If we wanted to take one question now, yeah, before absolutely. you go into the control control principles. So, if there's one question uh, to get some clarity on on what Oigen just covered, uh, which was quite a bit of material, please please go ahead. Hi, could you tell us what the technology situation is with DC breakers? Yeah. Um, so the DC breakers. Um, is that um, so? It's uh, as mentioned before. It will be pretty handy to have a DC breaker uh, to have uh, for the DC fault clearance uh, multi-terminal. So um, there are, are many suppliers who are uh, say, um, kind of uh, offering DC breakers. Uh, they say, okay, they have uh, different DC breakers technology being developed. Um, so far in the Western region, let's say in the Western outside of China, there is no DC breakers being in operation right now. Um, this is a kind of, uh, from my point of view, this is a kind of uh, is a chicken egg problem. Uh, saying, okay, we have uh, DC breakers, they are a different technology, and this, the, the main question is, how long does, should it take to clear a DC fault? And we are talking really about milliseconds. So if we are looking uh, how much are, let's say, um, are, are kind of a IGBT-based um, converter can clear the DC fault, like a full bridge. We can... A full bridge can clear the DC fault within a few microseconds. Looking at the DC breakers, mechanical DC breakers, well, uh, looking uh, in milliseconds. And depending on the ne uh, DC network topology, you might want to have it uh, clearance in microseconds, or you can go do it in milliseconds. So the problem right now is that um, is a kind of a saying, okay, uh, what is required by the DC grid? And uh, if you have a requirement, DC grid requirements, you can, you will need used to use either one, the one DC breaker technology or the other one. One is called uh, kind of a mechanical or hybrid DC breakers or solid state uh, DC breakers completely based on the semiconductor technology. So one or the other. Um, so the, the most, let's say, breakers being available on the market are hybrid DC breakers, which are full clearing times in milliseconds, which might not be sufficient from the DC grid point of view. So this is saying if we want to really apply the DC breakers for the um, for the DC grids, we need to define first how would you want to operate the DC grids, what is the resulting full clearing time, and then we can uh, apply then design or 
introduce the, the specific DC breakers for this purpose. Uh, one, one thing to also mention here, which is very important, you don't need HVDC circuit break, you don't need DC circuit breakers for HVDC lines, for individual lines. You need it for a mesh grid, for a mesh DC grid. For a DC line, you just have AC circuit breakers on, on, on the other side of the, the inverters and they can clear the fault just like an AC breaker do. But it's really the mesh configurations where you need to isolate one DC element from another DC element where DC circuit breaker have, have an advantage. There are a lot of these multi-terminal setups now being planned in Europe, but I think the initial phase of that multi-terminal is two HVDC lines that are later than linked together. And that at that later point, when you link them together into a network, that's when you need DC circuit breakers, but you don't really need them before then. Yeah, there's one thing I want to add here. Yeah, uh, coming to the facts actually. Yeah, there are two vendors. They've done like prototype testing. I mean, and also they've done like some qualification tests in Europe as part of EU funded research program. And they've done all the testing, but I don't say all of the vendors, like a couple of them done it. And coming to one of the projects in the in the Euro Tenet, TSO, they're planning two projects with HVDC breakers. They are going to go into operation in 2031, I think so. They are right now, as Hannah said, they're like done a normal point to point with a, with a multi-terminal ready. They're going to retrofit TC breaker in those projects going forward. But the plan is to make the, uh, put them into operation by 2031, 32. Yeah, but there's an intention. It is not real project. It has not so been. Yeah, it's, the plan. Yes. It's, it's the plan. That is the problem. Yeah. It's the plan. But say, okay, you want to have a DC breaker. What is your specification? What is the fault clearing time? Yeah, it's as long as there is no specification on the fault clearing, it, it's very difficult, you know, to sign up and saying, okay, which is technology to go with. It might be hybrid, might be sufficient. Okay. Then we will build uh, all the vendors. Uh, we will build uh, uh, kind of uh, the hybrid DC breakers. But if we say no, uh, we need a significant a full clearance time in less than one millisecond, we will need to go with the solid state breakers. And this is kind of a, uh, it's vice versa. The network application needs to define the equipment, not vice versa. And I think this is the problem that has been in the past that everybody's like, so what is capable, what is the VSC technology is capable to do? I mean, this is what we're talking about regulations. I think this is here should be vice versa. From the network operation point of view, we should get requirements saying, hey, this is a kind of a features. This is what we want to have from the network point of view. The uh, VSC vendors, please provide this functionality and not to wait, wait till there are kind of a VSC suppliers are coming with uh, some features um, which might be helpful, um, but kind of uh, doing like vice versa, specify and kind of what we're going to deliver, hopefully. Okay. Um, so just uh, kind of uh, going. Uh, really very quickly uh, to the control principle of the VSC HVDC um, uh, system. Um, just kind of uh, only uh, five minutes left, so I will keep it uh, very short, please. Uh, but yeah, please reach out to me if you have any further questions. So um, what is the, let's say, uh, looking on the MMC converters, this is a kind of a, this is the basic principle. So from the control point of view uh, of the VSC converter, if you look on the control structure, and this is uh, probably will similar on all the vendors, we have three different control loops. One is towards the AC side, one's towards the DC side, and one is the, let's say, the internal control loop. So uh, towards the AC side, it's straightforward. The AC side, it is defined by the AC grid, um, grid codes. They are in Europe, they are very specific HVDC grid codes. The same is now happening in US where the grid codes are being um, developed. Um, so this is kind of uh, if we look how this AC source is behaving, it's defined more or less by the uh, by the AC grid code. Um, this one, uh, looking on the DC side, this is what we are work we as an industry working right now to define also the grid code for the DC grid. I mean, this is I mean for the AC. Uh, side, we had a few decades to de develop. I mean, we want to be a little bit faster on the DC side, but this is, let's say, the lack of the standards that we are facing right now. There is no interoperability on the DC side. I mean, we can connect our uh, systems uh, close on the AC side to any other 
supplier. So this is, has been already proven in islanded networks operated, weak networks, strong networks, LCC, VSC, that works. That's absolutely fine. On the DC size, we don't have any of this interoperability. And let's say the biggest uh, kind of, a, let's say, um, a vendor specific design is this internal con uh, control is that means um, I have a more or less independent control of the AC side and DC side, but I still need uh, some balancing within the converter. And this is uh, what is done uh, within this um, control. So, and as, uh, so this internal control is mostly used for energy balancing as uh, using a kind of a as was um, was showing at the beginning, the MMC it has a distributed energy storage, and one of the major tasks in this energy storage is to balance all these small uh, volt uh, energy storages uh, to um, balance them um, appropriately, and this is what this internal control is doing for. Um, and this is kind of what I'm saying is that uh, looking at the size of the converter as mentioned before, the size is mostly defined by the uh, by the capacitors and capacitor means energy storage. And so, and looking now on the requirements that we see on the market is saying the dynamic performance requirement is what is defining on the size of the converter. So it's not only, let's say the steady state design, but we are kind of asking the customers always, hey, the steady state design is fine. What are the dynamic re requirements? Because the dynamic requirements are the key factor uh, for the uh, sizing. Um, of the converter. A uh, very quick, let's say, so just a few, uh, well, what is the control principle? So I think this is the main, uh, let's say, principle on the control is that during steady state operation, if we uh, run the converter, we don't need any kind of communication between rectifier and inverter. So the communication is done uh, direct more or less completely uh, through the let's say physical units in this, yeah, especially uh, the DC voltage. And this is especially for any uh, AC fault right through. There is, if we have an um, AC grid and we need the converter needs to uh, kind of operate in this AC grid uh, or the, the faulty AC grid, this all can happen without any communication uh, because it has to be very quickly. So we don't rely on the communication uh, in this case, um, this is straightforward. So this is a kind of um, uh, the basic uh, principle of this one. Um, very important to mention is that we have different control principles. Um, usually we can say uh, so far in all the systems in operation, we have so-called PQ operation mode of where the active and reactive power is then defined by the operator. Or we have UF control mode where we have uh, the the frequency and the voltage is then defined by the operator and the power flow is then defined by external, let's say uh, by the network operation. For example, this one is the most common one will be the wind farm connection on the wind farm connection on the rectifier side is the HVDC system is controlling the voltage and the frequency and the power flow is then defined by the wind turbine generators or if we have, let's say, in the black start operation, as uh, shown below, uh, we have um, the the converter station which is doing the black start. It is operating uh, voltage and frequency mode, and then the load itself is defined then by the uh, power that being um, connected to the uh, to the converter. Um, one of the let's say key features um, is um, is what is the uh, if we are talking about the PQ, um, P, uh, active power, reactive power control uh, mode, it is, we are talking about, let's say, a modulation principle of the control mode, uh, which means is that the operator, um, for example, is, is defining a certain power and saying, hey, I want to have a certain power um, amount of power being uh, transmitted. Let's say we have 1000 uh, megawatt system. I say, okay, I want to have 700 megawatts being constantly transmitted. And then I have modulation um, functions. What does it mean saying, okay, I have a 300 um, megawatt capability, which will might depend on um, network um, conditions. If I see, uh, for example, used for power oscillation damping or to be used for 
um, let's say if I see a certain uh, phase difference or if I see a frequency difference and based on this uh, difference in the frequency, I can then add or subtract the power uh, depending on the, on the difference. And this is what we're calling a modulation. That means it gives up a lot of flexibility in terms of the control. That means uh, the operator does not need to kind of um, to select, okay, do I want to have, um, let's say, um, active power control or want to have an AC line emulation. So you can go as shown here, you can have both. For example, if you have 1000 megawatt, I say, hey, I want to have 500 megawatt constant. And the other one power that I want to have the remaining power, 500 megawatts, um, the amount I want to, um, this power being depending on the phase angle. So this is a kind of a combination of an AC line. So the system, HVDC system is operating as an AC line, but with also um, a certain offset of the, of the active power. So that means this is a, gives you a maximum flexibility. And this is what has been already mentioned by Johannes um, to, let's say, to have, uh, to utilize all this functionality, you need also design tools in your network to kind of uh, to use this functionality of the systems. If you are using this one as the same constantly as a that's as a constant power, yeah, I mean that's fair enough. But uh, you are not utilizing the full capabilities uh, coming from the uh, from the HVDC system. Kind of uh, and one of the um, let's say examples to make it a little bit more yeah getting is, uh, for example, voltage control. AC voltage control um, is then based on the uh, reactive power. That means I can we can change the reactive power based on the, uh, on the AC voltage. Um, and this is, for example, this will be an input operator. So this input operator, it has a certain, let's say this is uh, will be behavior. That means you have an AC voltage and depending on the AC voltage, you can want to change the DC, sorry, the reactive power and this is the operator can, depending on the network condition, they can define a certain dead band um, where no reactive power should be applied. And then depending, they can define the, uh, the slope and the maximum uh, reactive power depending on the AC voltage. So this is the flexibility that you um, that the operators um, have. And this is, as I said before, this is a more or less kind of uh, all the flexibility, but uh, is available, it now should be utilized. So uh, coming coming to the end, so what is the key takeaway? Take away? So what you can say, HVDC market is now dominated by modular multi-level converter technology. The reliability is comparable with LCC system, uh, which is being on the markets for many decades, but the MMC technology already catched up uh, with this availability. Um, and different topologies are uh, available, and this is highly depending on the network operation requirement. So this is a kind of a, a there is a full, let's say, a scale of different options, and it's up to the operators uh, to define uh, which one um, is to take. Um, so the VCHVDC provides high flexibility in control modes, but which should be utilized uh, by the network. Um, and uh, it is capable to operate in very weak in the very island and even islanded networks. Uh, so which gives a, let's say, a, a kind of a more security uh, in building the systems because uh, they will be able also to operate in probably in a few decades uh, when the network topology has can significantly changed. And we have already AC grid uh, availability as well in US and European market. And we have a DC grid code uh, now being um, under development and hopefully available um, the next years. So that's it from my side. Thank you. And now if we have any of you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Eugen. Um, so Eugen built on the discussion that Hannes and Chandra just had and kind of went a level level below. So Hannes and Chandra are talking about the capabilities, uh, the applications. Eugen is going a level below saying this is how it's done and this is why HVDC is able to do that. So we'll open up to any questions. All right. My name's Henry Abrams. I'm an electrical engineer with Invenergy. We're a developer. We've done developed 30 gigawatts of wind, solar, and natural gas. And we're now in the transmission business. So I've been working on our HVDCs for about three years and excited to talk to you today about um, one of our specific projects. 
So getting started, we'll we'll kind of look at at the U.S. as a whole, the resources, the infrastructure, why a company that builds generation is now doing transmission. It's because it's needed. And then we're going to talk about some of the design considerations in our projects. We'll go through the, a quick study of case study of the Grain Belt Express. And then if we have time, we'll do a quick analysis of some feasibility studies. So getting started, look, looking at the U.S., as a whole, you kind of see some disconnects. So you see the solar in the South and the Southwest, you see wind in the central United States, but then you look at the, the load and you look at the existing transmission lines, like the renewable resource does not align with where the load is. And you see that the infrastructure isn't really there to transport that renewable energy from where it's really valuable and can be generated to where it's needed so there there's this fundamental disconnect and it's something that's plagued people like us who are building wind and solar you know where the best resource is there's often not interconnections there, sometimes there's not even existing transmission in the area and that's really kind of what's what's prompted a lot of developers getting into hvdc is is seeing the need um and talking a little bit maybe about kind of why it's like this it's it's sort of the the fundamentals of of how our power system got built was looking at regional areas where you would build fossil generation near your load and that that system kind of breaks down now that we're looking at larger scale implementation of renewables so so here's a quick comparison of some of the RTOs in their generation mix and what what you kind of see is MISO ERCOT SPP like there's a lot of wind generation already implemented there. PJM, New York ISO, ISO New England, they're they're struggling. And it, it kind of tracks with the the resources that we were just looking at on the last slide. Where there's wind, there's wind being implemented. Where there's not good wind or solar resource, it's a lot harder to implement it. So so we're really looking at ways to get that renewables from where it can be generated to where it's needed. And, and that's where we start looking at transmission solutions and HVDC. And so here, here's another overlay of those, those ISOs, RTOs, and the existing transmission lines in the US. And, and this paints a pretty clear picture. There's transmission built within these regions. There's a lack of inter-regional transmission. And not only does that make integrating renewables at a larger scale, scale more challenging, it also leads to some price differences in extreme weather events. And what you see here on the right is winter storm Uri, winter storm Elliot. And, and you start to see when extreme weather events are regional by nature and they hit one region, if there's not existing interregional transmission capability, that region may not be able to fully utilize support from its neighbors that, that could be available. And so, so that's another benefit to think about in HVDC is when you're building these long lines to connect renewables to the load as kind of the fundamental need, there's another opportunity, which is you can really help the system in extreme weather events um, by connecting these regions that don't really have the transmission planning processes and the existing lines in place to connect them to each other. And here's, here's just another look, you know, th thinking ahead, you see the map on the left, this, this is 2022, and there's wind in the central U.S., there's solar in the south, in the southwest, and then there's a lot of nuclear, coal, gas, where there is not as good renewable resource. And then, and then you look at the trend on the right, and you see renewables are increasing, um, as coal and others are being phased out. So, so there's just more of a need to, to integrate the renewables. But let's also keep in mind that kind of inter-regional benefit during severe weather events that are becoming more frequent and more severe by nature as, as we go through this. So, so now let's talk about the HVDCs. Um, when, when we're looking at integrating renewables over long distances, and, and what we're looking at here um, you know, we're looking at 500, 800, a thousand miles and to get the real best resource to the load that's really lacking that resource. 
Um, HVDC is the natural solution. I, I think Chandra and Hannes co covered that in, in great detail. These are kind of the same points here. Um, may, maybe one question on, on the right, you can kind of see an HVDC tower. Um, th this is an example of the Grain Belt Express Tower that's designed for five gigawatts. So it looks, I guess I, I would just think about what, what would a five gigawatt AC transmission corridor look like? It would look very different from this five gigawatt HVDC line right here. And that, that hopefully puts it in perspective. Why HVDC? So, so now that we're, we've got gotten to HVDC as, as the solution, I think we'll spend a bit more time talking about the, the different topologies, the ways to connect this. And, and I won't quite go to the bipole dual symmetric monopole that, that Eugen was talking about, but, but we'll kind of think about from the developer perspective, the points of interconnection, where do you go? Um, I think there's, there's kind of a traditional HVDC project that, that looks a lot like, uh, re, you know, uh, offshore wind. So, so you, the VSC HVDC can be used with an islanded generation system. That means there's no AC interconnection on your generation side and you build a generation tie line specifically from that generation project to your point of interconnection. Um, I, again, this looks a lot like offshore wind. There's some other projects ongoing in the US that also look like this. Um, Sun, Sunzia is one, there, there's a number of others. Um, and that, that's kind of like the traditional HVDC thinking that, that uh, is typically how these start. But I think thinking again about that inter-regional need and the lack of existing inter-regional transfer capability, these price spikes, there, there's an opportunity for these lines that are being developed to bring renewables from point A to point B to serve broader benefits to the system. And so what, what you can start looking at is adding an AC network connection on the generation side. And in that AC interconnection wouldn't necessarily need to be used for power delivery all the time. It, it could be used in emergency. Um, and, and that could be one way to kind of start to bridge this gap of interregional transfer. An, another opportunity would be to add additional stations and start to build out this multi-terminal network. So, um, oh, I'll, I'll get to it in a minute. But, but if you're going from the central U.S. to the East Coast, for an example, you're crossing other RTOs, other balancing authorities on the way. And you could kind of build out an interregional backbone through the natural path of the transmission line that's being built. And I, I think the maybe a challenge is that that more AC interconnections kind of means more challenges too. So um, this this is kind of a, a summary of some of the bigger pain points we're seeing right now, but the interconnection procedures and the processes, they're, they're different in each area. There's, there's no standard for HVDC interconnections in the U.S. That's something I think people are starting to work on, but, but needs a lot of work and, and creates challenge for a developer or anyone that's trying to build an interregional system if the planning processes are different in each region. I think a, another pain point is the technical process procedures and requirements in each region, those are also different. And it, as Hannes mentioned earlier, some of those technical requirements are, are not really tailored to VSC. And not only that, you know, may, maybe they don't make sense for VSC or, or they're not optimized, but on the other side, they probably don't take advantage of all the capability that VSC can do. And, and part of that is that um, VSC is not cannot be currently compensated for a lot of the ancillary services it can provide and the the system operators are are not really requesting all of the things that that it can do and so there, there's kind of this disconnect where you're fitting a round peg into a square hole um another 
pain point is is probably the the cost allocation of network. And so thinking about these gigawatt scale projects, they come with gigawatt scale network upgrade costs. And, and that doesn't necessarily account for some of the system benefits and other things that these VSC HV DC projects can provide. Like it, you know, in that, in that winter storm URI example, where prices PP spike, you know, that that's not a, a service that's currently compensated for in transmission system planning. Um, but you still get hit with with the upgrade costs of developing that. So there, there's this idea that that interregional transmission is a something that's needed. I think VSC is a great solution because of the things we talked about earlier, the controllability. But there's also challenges when you when you add more interconnections. And I think that that is to some extent steering some projects to point to point interconnections with islanded generation systems that really aren't providing all the benefit to the power system that they could be. And so now, now we'll dive into one of Invenergy's projects, the Grain Belt Express. Um, and just, just at a high level, this, this is what the project looks like. It starts in southwestern Kansas, goes through about 540 miles to Missouri with an HVDC line. And then another 260-ish miles to Illinois, uh, where it connects to PJM. So all in all, it's about 800 miles of HVDC line, and it does have that kind of three-terminal nature. Um, the total rating will be 5 gigawatts, 600 kV HVDC bipole with dedicated metallic return. And... We'll, we'll kind of go through our thought press process here in this project. And, and it's kind of the things we were talking about earlier. So at, at the very root of it, the project is bringing the best renewable resource in southwestern Kansas, wind, solar, to areas that may not otherwise have access to that renewable resource. There's your benefits. Um, if you're thinking about system in Missouri, system in PJM, um, you also not only get access to high capacity factor renewables, they're also getting access to renewables that are not correlated to their local renewables. So you kind of get this offset where, you know, the wind or the solar peaks in Southwestern Kansas differ from the system that they're typically building renewables within. And that, that can provide a good benefit as well. And then thinking about, again, the multi-terminal nature, you get that inter-regional transfer capability, bi-directional power flow. In the case of emergency, you can send power from MISO or PJM back to SPP. Um, you can provide system restoration benefits. I think we were talking about Black Start earlier, where, where the VSC could actually be used to Black Start one network from another. And, and you start to get into these additional ancillary services that a multi-terminal project like this can provide. So look at, looking at the project, you know, it may, maybe at the root of it, you're bringing renewables to areas that don't have access to renewables. We, we talked about MISO earlier. Um, they, they have pretty high penetration of renewables. Um, why, why would we add a terminal in MISO? And, and it's kind of going back to the root of it. You know, there's opportunity there for this inter-regional system backbone. There's opportunity to get generation that's not correlated to the local and, and again, higher capacity factors. So um, grain, grain Belt has really taken the shape on the right there where it's starting to be built out as a, this inter-regional multi-terminal backbone where you have a five gigawatt line providing transfer capability between SPP, MISO, PJM, um, rather than just an islanded generation system in Kansas delivering to PJM. That's kind of a, a one purpose line. It's delivering power to a load and, and doesn't provide much more grain belt starting to be built out as what could be this key interregional backbone in the United States. And here's, here's a quote from the Kansas City Star. Um, it was from someone who was at SPP at the time, and 
they were talking about winter storm Yuri, and I think they they acknowledge lines like Grain Belt Express could have been the savior. You know, having that additional transfer capability from MISO or from PJM back into their system when they're really struggling, that's it's it's incredible. Um, and that's something that that could add a lot of value to the power system. So looking at the Grain Belt Express, um, we can dive a little bit into how the HVDC line starts to look. So I said earlier, the DC voltage is plus or minus 600 kV bipole. And so you kind of see that the two converters that Eugen was talking about on either side here, um, each converter is approximately 25, each bipole is approximately 2,500 megawatts. So, so you end up with two converter stations working in parallel to send the power on the SPP side, one 2,500 megawatt converter in the Missouri part, and then another 2,500 megawatt converter in the Illinois part. Um, all the AC side connections are 345 kV. Uh, it does have bipole with dedicated metallic return. Um, and it's using the half bridge VSC. So uh, there's, I think, a, a few key advancements that are that are coming with this project. Um, number one, something that jumps out is is the power and the voltage ratings of the VSC. So um, 600 kV, and then thinking about an overall five gigawatt system, even if it's two 2,500 megawatt converters, that's that's still a step in technology that that needs to be made here um looking at the the multi-terminal aspects so um what Oigen slides earlier kind of showed the control modes and the in the thinking behind point to point and how those converters need to communicate and, and interact together it gets a lot more complex when when you add a third station um so so that's something we're working through as well and then the Another piece is is a DC side fault response. So um, when there's a, a fault in the DC line, the coordination to clear and restart quickly from that fault is is a key piece of that of the project. Um, and and that's something that that this will be pushing forward as well. And then kind of at, at a high level, just integrating renewables with HVDC. So um We've kind of talked about the islanded system that maybe traditionally how how we think about things. It, it gets even more complex with overhead lines, with long overhead lines, with a five gigawatt renewable system in a weak AC network down there in southwestern Kansas. Um, the, these are all challenges and things that we're working through right now. Um, and, and a huge piece of it, too, is is really collaborations with the OEMs and the system designers, the equipment manufacturers, the networks, the utilities, the ISOs. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's been a, a good learning experience and, and we're still growing through the project. We got time. Okay. So, so now we can touch really quickly thinking about maybe an example of, of how this islanded network piece could be done. So this is not going into the full multi-terminal AC side connection, but this is your traditional point-to-point -point islanded AC generation system connected radially to, to a load. Um, and, and what we'll talk through is just kind of some examples, one example of uh, the performance of the HVDC. So we're, we're going to look at that typical interconnector point-to-point and we're going to see what happens when there's an AC network fault um, on the on the AC side or on the receiving end. And so this this isn't grain belt specific. We're looking at typical 525 kV bipole with DMR, 2000 megawatt, um, and the topology is kind of at the bottom there. So, so what you see is that topology, there's, there's something in this islanded system that's a dynamic braking resistor that, that is typically added. It's a little different in offshore because you have all the constraints of an offshore platform, but onshore, you look at that on the AC bus with the generation and it's used to dissipate 
the renewable generation on that side during a system fault on the DC side or the AC receiving end where you have an interruption of power transfer capability, it keeps you from having to cross trip all the generation um, in any sort of disturbance like that. So we'll take a really quick look at, at how that's activated, how it works. And it, what you see is the, there's a receiving end bus fault at that, at that inverter terminal. The HVDC active power transfer goes to zero. Then what you see in the bottom there is the DC link voltage starts, um, the DC link voltage then activates the AC chopper. That's that breaking resistor and, and that dissipates the excess energy. And so, so this, this is kind of where we get into some of the system benefits that Hannes and Chandra were talking about, but, but that inverter station, these converter stations can independently control reactive power. And you can see the inverter station, it's still, it provides bars to transport the AC voltage at that bus that was faulted. Meanwhile, the rectifier end, it can keep that grid forming islanded system. There, there's not much voltage dip. It, the, the turbines don't get, go into fault ride through because they don't see much. They see the AC chopper as the load instead of the remote end. And so at the, at the end, this is kind of a proof of concept of some EMT studies of, of how these systems can perform. Um, and the performance can still be fine tuned with OEM support and models and um, even achieve better performance. So in summary, I, I think we wanted to highlight there's there's a, a need for interregional transmission, both to as we continue building more renewables and um, as extreme weather events become more frequent and more severe. I think VSC HVDC is a per preferred solution, which Chandra and Hannes talked about. Um, it's also a feasible solution, which we touch very lightly on today. Um, and then as we start to think about more and more HVDCs and the best way to build it, I, I think grain, grain belt is a good example of, you know, there's going to be further advancements needed. And that's going to require industry and OEM collaboration on all aspects from the AC interconnection process to the equipment design and the project specification and the construction commissioning operations. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done and we're fortunate to be working through it with everyone here. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Okay. All right. I didn't realize. Okay. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a, from the renewable perspective, we have developed so much more renewable and the renewable is a, also change the flow pattern and the congestion in the system. And now we looking into the uh, looking into the new development, so it's a need to, for the transmission to handle this uh, renewable. We build the AC, build a lot of AC system and the uh, Right now, we ha we deliver a lot of the new HVDC system like Transwest Express, So Green Line, Sun Sun Zier proposal, a lot of the HVDC proposal, and offshore wind integration needed HVDC. Then the interregional study it's a uh, it's uh, from the Hydro Quebec to the U.S. system, and also the I'm talking about this is called the Power from Prairie project which is a proposed like a original idea coming six years ago and start looking at between the East and West. It's a, a synchronized system, how we connect it together. Um, so when we're looking at this, uh, this concept, it's a, it's a link that not just itself, but the Power from Prairie project is in the middle of the, from the, uh, from the Wyoming all the way to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, MISO system, and uh, in the, in this system, it's uh, we are also connected to the other HVDC. Uh, to the east, uh, we talk about So Green Line connected to So Green Line to all the way to the, uh, the to the Chicago area. To the west, uh, we go through the Transwest Express connected to the Utah, 
and from Utah connect to the IPv DC tie to the California. So it's a the the basically build a HVDC superhighway between the California all the way to the um, uh, to the Chicago area. And also there's a couple of things I want to, uh, the Henry helped me prepare the renewable development. Uh, California, it's uh, very rich on the solar power system. And the, in the middle of the country, they have a lot of the wind power. So we pass through the, uh, the high renewable development potential. This is a multi-terminal HVDC. Multi-terminal HVDC means that they have a, uh, right now we design is a five terminal. It's a, have different uh, location and uh, injected 4,000 megawatt into the system. And when we built this study and we realized that uh, there's no database available for us to study and uh, it, it's not, it's a building between the east and west, you need to cover both region, uh, normally the MISO SPPPGM area using PROMAD and the WECC using GRIVIO, it's a very troublesome to building a combined model to, to do this study. It's a, we have to do this work from the, uh, from the beginning it's a, uh, to using the MISO case and uh, uh, to represent the East interconnection and then we convert the, convert the PROMAD database to the GRIVIO and do the benchmark. Then we merge after benchmark, we merge together the, to the grid view. And we need to, because the, originally there's a same uh, HVDC, small H, 200 megawatt HVDC between the East and West. We need to build, change them to be, to be the HVDC model. Uh, there's a many different things. Uh, this is a consistency between the East and West model. When you, if you're doing the planning model, you realize the, there's an assumption is a lot of differences between the East database and the West database. Uh, data source, data, uh, uh, it's a planning year, those kind of things, all kind of differences. For example, the uh, at that time, it's a, a WECC is using 2009 historical wind solar load profile and the MISO using 2018 wind solar load profile. We cannot connect them together, uh, use a different uh, historical year weather pattern to do that. Another thing is looking at the uh, WECC using the 2021 uh, dollar uh, measure the value, uh, the dollar value and uh, uh, MISO using 2030 dollar value. So it's a kind of, the, it's all kind of the differences is a, is a need to be ironed out before you can, you can build the case. Uh, so we, we choose to use in 2018, the wind solar load profile to build the case and uh, for East and the West. And we also looking at the differences on the CO2 emission rate and also the uh, curtailment, how they how they define East and West a little bit different. So we have to uh, make the consistency and so we can uh, stand on the equal footage when we compare the, the project. Um, this is the benchmark. It's not perfect benchmark because of the modeling it really handled uh, handle unit commitment economic dispatch a little bit differently. So we try our best to uh, to make sure the the MISO data is uh, faithfully converted and the model is in the grid view. So we capture the major trend from the flow perspective, from generation perspective. You can see this is a similar, very similar performance. And then after that, we merge with the WECC case. We're building this uh, merged case is uh, 110 buses in the system and uh, a lot of the generation and transmission system is uh, all together. When we're looking at the result of the different location LMP price, and you can see the uh, price hub, the price is quite big differences. They are create a value for us to build the inter-regional transmission uh, project. Similarly, you can do the SPP, uh, MISO uh, plot this. Uh, you can see also significant uh, pricing uh, differences between the different uh, hub. And that is a, a very good for us to understanding there's a, um, there's a transmission congestion and uh, it's a, the HVDC can bypass in those uh, congestion and deliver the power to the low center. 
this is an original study. The base case is just have IPPDC tie in this uh, system. And uh, then we build in the, the scenario A is building the Transwest Express and the Sioux Green Line uh, into one is in the West, uh, Transwest Express, and the other is uh, um, the Sioux Green Line. Then between the, then the in between them, uh, we build the um, scenario B, basically is building the line in between. And this is uh, some of the, when we do the transmission project, it's uh, A plus B uh, equal to, maybe it's bigger than the A plus B itself. So it's, this is uh, the example we were trying to using this, uh, uh, using this uh, topology so we can extend the HVDCs longer than itself. And the benefit is uh, better than itself. It's uh, if you, you evaluate the individual project, the benefit may be lower than the working with other projects together. They both improve them, uh, complement each other. This is a Transwest Express. I don't give the too much detail and the Sioux Green Line. Uh, it's a 3,000 megawatt uh, from the Wyoming to the Transwest Express. It's a 3,000 megawatt uh, Transwest Express to the U Utah area and also the 1,500 megawatt AC line from the Utah to the uh, Nevada. Sioux Green Line is the HVDC underground, the 2100 megawatt. Um, this is a this is a looking at the, the simulation production cost simulation, and uh, the Transwest Express uh, is utilized significantly. And uh, you can see the there's a there there's a clip on the both direction, the positive direction and negative direction about 1600 megawatt is because of the transmission, AC transmission connection limitation at the two transformer is 1600 megawatt. So this is a Transwest Express. It's a, uh, the Sioux Green Line is west to east. So it's a, it's a utilization looks like this. And when we building the scenario B is a multi-terminal HVDC from the Wyoming to the Colorado to the South Dakota to the Iowa, um, all the way along along the line, five station, 900 megawatt, um, 900 uh, uh, miles, and a 600 kV system, HVDC system. Um, then this is a this is a individually five the converter station is operating. You optimize the five op uh, converter optimized simultaneously and find the, where is the best transfer between them. And this is a, one of the interesting thing is a, if you look at the upper left, that's a Wyoming converter station. And the first half is a positive, dominant in the positive. And the second half is a dominant in the negative. So that's is an indicator in the first half, uh, we are starting sending the power into the, into the power from prayer project. And in this particular uh, case is uh, uh, when we're building the, the case build up, it's a uh, Northwest Hydro is a very heavy uh, uh, hydro generation in the first half of the gen uh, first half of the year. So that's the that's a part of the energy can be using the transmission system to transfer to the to the east. So the east is uh, can be benefit from the, um, the the hydro generation. And at the end, it's uh, if the second half when they are run, sh the water is run away, and we can use in the east to help to uh, to support the Wyoming um, all the WEC side at, at the Wyoming uh, station. Okay, um, so the it's a uh, the, there's a couple other thing you can uh, look at the individually converted optimized. Then you can look at the transmission line. It's a because this is a radio uh, radio connection. It's a uh, it's one to two, two to three, three to four, four to five. So it's a basically it's a you can see the DC line is a utilization, and uh, um, compared with the scenario A and scenario B, scenario B is a building the bridge between the east and west. You can see the um, they used to be the scenario A, the Transwest Express, the cap at the sixteen hundred megawatt. And now is the cap at the 3,000 megawatt. They are not have a 1,600 megawatt 
uh, cap anymore. And also we can see significant California high, uh, California solar is a push back to the HVDC system to using the uh, using IPBDC, HV, uh, the Transwest Express all the way to the, uh, to the east. So you can utilize a lot of the uh, excess uh, solar generation in the system. And also you can see the significant power in the, the from scenario A to scenario B, it's a much higher power is a, is a using, using the Transwest Express. Um, so here is a couple of the uh, key uh, findings of the uh, result. It's a, uh, for example, scenario A, you can create the close to $800 million the benefits. And the one thing I want to, uh, to, to reference here is uh, scenario B is a continue to uh, improve the benefits further. Um, the emission, uh, the, each case can bring the bring down the CO2 emission. The one thing, uh, another thing I want to point out is the enable the renewable development. You can see the, the top chart is uh, uh, referred to the increase the renewable uh, in the system. And uh, the bottom is uh, reduce the curtailment. In the scenario B, we, we install the nine nine terawatt hour of the renew new renewable. Um, at end, the, the scenario B is uh, almost the increased uh, um, twelve terawatt hour the, the renewable generation because they reduce the curtailment by two point five uh, terawatt hour. So it's that's uh, the benefit of this uh, HVDC system can help. Um, this is a this is you look, looking at the benefit uh, perspective. You can see the uh, Transwest Express scenario A is not competing with the Power from Pearl project. Is uh, actually they enhance each other. Uh, second thing I want to say is uh, um, it's uh, from the from the Wyoming to Colorado. Uh, there is AC transmission system, and uh, this uh, HVDC can bypass AC congestion and deliver power to the um, to the Colorado area. Um, then we also looking at the, um, when we build the, the DC tie through the system, we also need the AC supporting system to bring the renewable to the, uh, to the uh, DC line. So that is included the cost of the, our study. And also the, there's a, a lot of the uh, long distance economic transfer between the system. Um, and not just the, the uh, energy transfer also can reserve sharing, can, can capacity sharing, those uh, benefit can be, it's an improved availability and resilience. Um, uh, the one thing it's, uh, we, are, we are exploring is uh, whether they could be teamed together, it's a Transwest Express Power from Prairie project, it's a, there is a one station at the Wyoming, whether they can merge, becoming a multi-terminal HVDC. So that's a, something is a, save big on the capital cost. I don't know one converter will be at the cost of six, maybe $600 million or more. So it's a, it's a very big saving for the capital cost. Um, the multi-terminal HVDC converter sizing right now is that we, we don't do the optimization. We just do the 4,000 for every station, but in the phase two study, we will be looking at the, each station, how much it needed and uh, uh, those kind of things uh, will be optimized, the sizing of the converter. And also the multi-terminal HVDC, the con control, uh, uh, the optimization is, uh, is cannot be mimicked by two terminal HVDC. So especially the, uh, this, uh, this size of the problem. Uh, we need that when we have a transmission uh, connected to the high renewable, like a wind, uh, wind, uh, wind region, we should be doing the regional study, MISO, SVP, uh, WECC need to do a capacity expansion to identify the, the resource can be utilized the, the, at the good location, not just the using the traditional local area. Um, so it's uh, enable the renewable and uh, uh, reduce the curtailment. The, the summary of this is the primary benefit of the, we use a adjust the production cost as a primary uh, benefit and the capacity value. Then we looking at the benefit cost ratio 
uh, for the it's a one point four four is for the in, investor financer uh, financial investor uh, uh, financial oh no it will public financial and if you invest uh, investor financial the the benefit cost ratio is 0.82. So it's a really is a uh, it's it can be working with the public power, but it's a it's a still need a further improvement, to reduce costs and improve the benefits for the design of the uh, project. And also the um, uh, one thing we want to say the additional study is needed to looking at the resilience, reliability, and the reserve sharing uh, resource adequacy those benefit the decarbonization, those benefit in the future study. Uh, one thing I want to point out is the benefit study, cost the ratio study, we we find out is that if you have HVDC project with the uh, renewable building, it gives us a much better benefit cost ratio. Um, so this is a this is a national the 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 extreme weather condition and the renewable Target is a. Uh, it's not just the local uh, problem. It's a national problem. It's it is required national solution. That's conclude my presentation. Thank you.